Hello and welcome back. In this course, the circuit that we are going to talk about is called the current mirror. This circuit is called as mirror because if we were to have the circuit, the left part looks similar to the right part. Current mirroring is an important principle in integrated circuit technology. All the connected transistors in an IC work in the principle of current mirroring. From audio amplifier circuits to operation amplifiers and all sorts of ICs that exist have at least one current mirror circuit. So what I'm trying to say is that there are plenty of applications in which a current mirror is required, but what exactly makes this configuration so useful and special? The current mirror circuit gains its name because it copies or mirrors the current flowing in one active device in another, keeping the output current constant regardless of loading. If the circuit has the ability to mirror the current, then there has to be an input terminal where the desired current comes in, and that current afterwards will be copied on the other branch where the load is connected. The input of the circuit is represented by a DC power supply with a resistor in series. Try to look at these two as a different circuit which somehow provides the current to this branch. Your imagination is the only limitation. The resistor here is used to limit the current, which means, in this case, without it, we would blow up this transistor. And why is that? Because the base voltage would be on 5 volts, which means that the base emitter diode will turn on and practically there is nothing to limit the current, only the built-in emitter resistance, which as we know it's very low. So the basic current mirror configuration is uh, shown here, which comprises two transistors, one of which has the base and collector connected and the other does not. The base connection of both transistors are then linked, as are the emitters which are also taken to ground. So let's call the current that comes from the input as programming current, because this current will set the current flow through our load. As we see here, the current on the collector is 4.3 mA, and how can we calculate that? It's very important for you to understand that because the base of this transistor is tied to the collector, this transistor practically acts just like a simple diode. So if you replace this transistor with a simple diode, you will notice that the current didn't really change. Well, the current is higher with 0.2 mA because this particular diode is not exactly the same as the base emitter diode, it has a slightly lower voltage drop across it. Using the second law of Kirchhoff, we can easily calculate the current as it's 5 volts minus the voltage drop across the diode, which is uh, 500 millivolts, all divided by this resistance. Now, the same equation applies when the transistor is back, but this time, the current will be 5 volts minus the base emitter voltage drop, all divided by 1 kilo ohm. However, this equation does not take into account the fact that both transistors draw a certain amount of base current, and the current for both bases also flows through this resistance. Thus, the correct equation is the programming current is equal to the current flowing on the collector plus 2 times the base current. Assuming that both transistors are exactly the same, the same current will flow on each transistor's base, hence the same current on the collector, because the collector current is equal to the base current times beta. This means that even if we change the value of the load, it won't have any effect on the current flowing on the collector. So using this configuration, we can successfully mirror the current from one branch to another. This two transistor current mirror is often adequate for most applications, however it has some noticeable limitations under many circumstances. For example, the current on the second branch can vary with the change in the output voltage, and this means that if I change the output voltage to some other value, in real world, this current will vary a little bit. This is because there is a slight variation of base emitter voltage with the collector voltage at a given current. Another noticeable limitation is that the current matching is dependent on transistor matching. So the current mirroring is dependent upon the matching of the transistors. Often the transistors need to be on the same substrate if they are to accurately mirror the current. So if the two transistors having the same part number are not manufactured side by side at the same time, they will have slightly different characteristics. 
Of course, in the simulator we won't see this type of problem, since both transistors are perfectly the same. The third problem is the base current required by any bipolar junction transistor. This base current is small for high gain transistors, but it is still present and is still a source of error. So in order to overcome some of these issues, more advanced current mirror circuits can be developed and used. As we mentioned before, there is a mismatch between the programming current and the output mirrored current caused by the unavoidable presence of the base current for the two transistors flowing through this resistance. The problem is that we can't really see this mismatch right now because in this simulator both transistors are exactly the same, but in real world that is very hard to find. With high gain transistors though, the difference is small and sometimes negligible, but sometimes it must be recognized and minimized. So the base current is provided by the current coming from the input, right? Which is the current passing through this resistance. And as we said, the base current is a source of error in the calculations and we wanted to reduce this. A simple way to reduce the current flowing through this resistance is to add a third transistor to the circuit. Now the base current for Q1 and Q2 is also the emitter current of Q3, right? And only the base current for Q3 must still flow through this resistance. This effectively reduces the base current error by a factor of beta plus 1. Adding Q3 to the circuit will change the programming current a little bit since Q1 no longer has its collector and base connected together. Instead, we have an extra base emitter voltage to account for. For this circuit, the programming current is equal to the power supply voltage minus 2 times base emitter voltage, all divided by this resistance. If we add an emitter resistor to a single transistor amplifier, we get negative feedback or what is called as degeneration. In the previous course we have seen that by adding an emitter resistor to the transistor, we could set the gain of this amplifier because the gain of this circuit is equal to the collector resistance divided by emitter resistance. So even though the transistor has a maximum gain of 100, our circuit will not amplify the input signal by 100 because the emitter resistor impedes that. We wanted a gain of 10, so we have chosen the values correspondingly. It's very important for you to understand that the emitter resistance has purposes other than stabilizing the gain. The emitter resistance improves many properties of the common emitter amplifier, of course for the expense of gain. This resistance acts like a negative feedback for the circuit, a feedback that will notice the transistor whenever the current flowing from collector emitter rises. And what do I mean by that? Let's imagine a scenario where the current flowing on the collector emitter is rising for some reason. And what happens? If the emitter current starts rising, the voltage drop across the emitter resistance starts increasing too, right? And what happens then? Well, if the voltage across the emitter resistance rises, it means that the base emitter voltage starts decreasing, right? The base voltage is constant, so if the emitter voltage is increasing, the base emitter voltage will decrease. Which means nothing else, but the transistor will start slowly to turn off in order to prevent the current to rise. So I hope you got the idea. If you have any doubts, don't hesitate to leave a comment below. One of the reasons the current flowing from the collector to emitter can potentially rise is because of temperature. As the temperature of a transistor increases, the collector current will increase too. The presence of the emitter resistance provides negative feedback which stabilizes the circuit against changes in temperature, supply voltage, etc. The only downside of using an emitter resistance is that the gain is reduced, but the advantages exceed the downsides since it gives a better gain control, temperature stability, it also improves the frequency response like for example it gives a flatter passband response, etc. In digital circuits where you are operating the transistor from cutoff to full saturation, emitter degeneration is, it is rarely used. Alright, so as I have explained before, emitter resistors provide a negative feedback. While current mirrors without emitter resistors work well in integrated circuits, because the parameter differences of the neighboring transistors are insignificant, and so is the difference in temperature, their performance is not satisfactory when built from discrete elements. If this resistance is removed, the bias current will grow with temperature, causing an equal increase in the output current. 
So in conclusion, the emitter resistance has the function to stabilize the current mirror, current against temperature changes. Alright, so the last thing I want to show you is a popular configuration of current mirror. In fact, this configuration got the name of Wilson current mirror. I don't know why it's called like that, probably the guy called us Wilson came up with this idea to add a third transistor here. As you might have noticed, Wilson current mirror doesn't have emitter resistances and the reason of that, this third transistor already provides a negative feedback for this circuit. So how does it work? A small amount of current flowing through this resistance provides base current for Q3, enabling Q3 to conduct current. The bulk of this current, as with any transistor, flows from collector to emitter. At the same time, the emitter current of Q3 becomes the programming current for the current mirror formed by Q1 and Q2. As we have already seen when studying the basic current mirror circuit, the collector current of Q1 is equal to the collector current of Q2, and so the emitter current of Q3 is equal to the collector current of Q2 plus 2 times the base current. This arrangement provides a form of negative feedback loop. If for any reason the collector current of Q3, which is the output current driving the load, right? So if this starts to increase, the collector current of Q2 must likewise increase, and the collector current of Q1 will mirror that increase. This will increase the voltage drop across this resistance, which will in turn reduce the base voltage of Q3. So this Q3, which provides a negative feedback, prevents the output current to rise, which gives a better stability for this circuit.